here. Make it a little bit brighter. Okay. Now we're right now this the scene has the renderer set to the default settings. So this is regular full on GI. That's why we're getting all these nice soft shadows and everything. I have no ambient occlusion on. Um, so let's go ahead and turn the light on so we can get our spec back in. And here's a key point. This is very important for basically I would say this is in, important for whenever you're rendering with an HDRI. Um, for the actual as the light source in your scene I would say that there's two things you normally would want to do. You would want to make the HDRI small and you would want to blur it. Now there are different ways to blur it. We're not going to go over it in this demonstration. Um, some actually will result in a more accurate uh, representation of the different uh, light strengths in the HDRI, uh, the different intensities. But for this demonstration we're just going to go pretty much brute force and we're going to use the anti-aliasing. Um, the, it, it'll kind of blur your image right away, but I find that around four or five for your minimum spot is a good place to get started. You could go as high as 20 or 15, especially if you're still seeing some noise in your renders. And what this is going to do is just going to even out the lighting. Uh, it, it basically is going to remove more of the noise and there's less work that you have to do with the actual render engine when you do this. If you had reflections in the scene, say I wanted the teeth to be a little bit sharper or whatnot, I would actually start up another environment. I would make it only visible to reflection rays, and I would not blur it, so I'd have a nice defined reflection. So, so again, the key things are here: you need an HDRI. This actually does not. This method does not work with the environment material. Uh, I actually don't know why but it does not. So you need to use an HDRI and you'll need to set the anti-aliasing uh, on and you'll need to up your spot until you can get the image blurred to an area where it's starting to produce a smooth render. Okay, now the most important part. Go to the render tab in the render tree. Go to global illumination and the first thing we're going to do is for now we're going to put this at 1. And you can see if we turned off irradiance caching what we would get. So we're just going to be dealing with one sample. And the most important thing as the um, demonstration in the title is to get the indirect range very low. Um, I found that 1 micron is good enough but you can go as low as what is it? One one hundredth of a micron, I think. So the way to do this is just put in as many zeros as you want. Put in a one. Whoops! I'm sorry. That was not true. Put in. You could do. I think. What do we have? Seven zeros. Yes, seven zeros. You get point. You can actually go to even further. I think. I think you can go point zero zero one microns. Maybe you just want to type it in. And, not be lazy like me. So 0 0.001 microns. So what would that be? A thousandth of a micron or something like that? A hundredth of a micron? Sorry, as you can tell, I'm not a math star. So the next thing you'll want to do uh, to help smooth it out is to up your radiance caching to 256. You can go a little bit higher, but I find that this pretty much does it. Okay, so right away we can see that we've lost all the things that come for free are not quite so free with regular Monte Carlo and GI since basically it works indirect range works by and Brad Peebler has an excellent Lux TV explanation that's going to be far better than mine and way more technical but basically on the surface if you set the indirect range to any level it's going to say okay from this area I'm going to look out into the scene and within that range, if I see something, I'm going to do another calculation. If I look out that distance and I don't see something, I'm going to look up the background and apply that color to my surface. So in a nutshell, we've put it at the most extreme minimum. Basically, the ray is hardly even at all leaving the surface here. 
Uh, so it can't even look at anything near it, and it's just going to return the value of the background. So this is similar to, say, how background radio radiosity works in light wave, or how in mental ray, if, if you use the ambient occlusion shader um, with special settings and set it to environment lookup, you'll basically get the same exact thing, um, at least at render time. So, so we set it to the minimum. It's only going to look out. It's only going to see the background. Uh, therefore, it's not seeing like this mouse. It's not getting darker. There's nothing occluded here. So we need to go in and add some different things to uh, darken things up and add back in some of that detail. Uh, the first option is ambient occlusion, except for in the mouth, I feel like it's kind of a waste. Um, so one of your options would be to use ambient occlusion in the mouth. Another option would be to use negative light in the mouth. And yet another one is to get by with, as far as you can, doing texture painting or weight painting uh, with a constant, which is what I went ahead and did. Now at first I have to go ahead and click these twice to get it to go through. Sometimes it takes more than that. Okay. And you can see now that we have it darkened up in the mouth. And this is just using a constant. You can see here it's set to this color. Let's go ahead and do something kind of gross. And so you can see that it's what's going on in there. So I just have a constant shader set up. And then that is being driven by a weight map, which I just dragged onto it to create a layer mask. So I just painted in the mouth some polygons, set their value on a, on a weight map, and use that. So that saves a lot of time. You could use ambient occlusion, but it's just kind of overkill and it's a waste of time. So then I have a kind of a global um, ambient occlusion that I've applied over the whole surface. And then uh, for the tongue, I felt like it needed to be slightly darker. It's probably overkill, but I put ambient occlusion on that separately in addition. And then on the teeth, I went ahead and add a little bit because I felt like they they weren't getting occluded very well by the the uh, lip here. So it's real subtle, but I feel like it makes a difference. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the setup. Of course, our hair would want some ambient occlusion too. Let's go ahead and put that in. There's other ways you could uh, shade and light the hair, but this will work. And we're done. That's how you do it. Now, there's one. There's a couple things you can do if you're still getting a little bit of flickering and noise uh, that actually, oddly enough, can actually speed up render times. So let's go ahead and go ahead and render this out. And most of the time is going to be spent on the ambient occlusion and the hair. And I am on a fairly slow four core system and also using Camtasia, which everyone knows slows renders way down. So that was 18 seconds roughly. Let's go ahead and up these settings. Now the two settings that you can up to help help it along and help remove any extra blur, uh, I would start with your indirect rays at 64 and then oddly enough even though there's no bouncing that can really happen setting your indirect bounces at 4. These two things um, both seem to sometimes smooth things out if they're not smooth. With 99% of the time I've noticed that everything's smooth right from the get-go. Uh, but they also oddly can actually speed up the render time. And I'm sure someone on the forum like Captain Obvious or Alan Hastings, the creator of the render engine, could explain it maybe a little better, but at worst these don't seem to slow it down. Uh, sometimes they speed up the render. So this time it only sped it up a little bit. Uh, unfortunately Camtasia is running. I've actually seen it sometimes speed it up by a couple seconds. So. But again, no real uh, hit there on the render time. So to conclude, an uh, indirect range along with a blurred HDRI produces a GI-like render that's very reliable, very stable, and easy to use. Um, if you're going to go ahead and do direct lighting on your scene, use any kind of direct lighting technique, 
this could be a really good foundation to starting out your scene, especially if you have any character animation or even camera animation in your scene. Monte Carlo straight up and Monte Carlo with a radiance caching, there's no doubt about it, you're going to get a much more realistic look. Uh, you could spend a long time doing some direct lighting and getting extremely close, but there's just no bones about it. Uh, using some of the more advanced ray, trace, um, ray tracing methods in Monte Carlo, you're going to get a very believable nice render. However, as we all know, it's going to take a long time for it to render to get rid of the noise. So just go ahead and think about using this indirect range as just another another tool in your tool set to help get speedy renders done and help battle back the onslaught of your clients wanting a render ASAP. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration. Uh, we hope to have more Portland Area Moto Users Group demonstrations posted online both in the forums on and on the site via YouTube. Uh, watch the threads for any information if you're in the area or going to be visiting the area on when our meetings are. We're going to try to ho hold them monthly and we hope to have a few, um, basically a few demonstrations each time and uh, then a great set of way of meeting and networking with other 3D professionals in the area. So again, hope you like this demonstration. Thank you for watching.